in the last stream, we were working on furthering our progress through the second quest line in the quest book here, the factory quest line. And right at the end of the last stream, we finally managed to make our first water wheel, albeit in a rather uh, janky fashion and in a rather uh, inappropriate location. I believe it was right here in the middle of the room, just kind of down as a proof of concept. And what I've gone ahead and done between streams is I've done a tiny little bit of base redesign. I've basically added this wall here to make this room uh, that we're currently in symmetrical and then kind of create a second room over here for our ore processing system. I did want to do a lot more uh, work on the base between streams, but as of right now, the only method that we currently have of uh, digging out stone is with this regular stone pickaxe, which while not necessarily slow, is also not necessarily fast either. And it does take quite a while, especially if you're wanting to dig out large areas of space, which I think is what we're going to have to do, especially if we want to set up, um, you know, an upper floor, a lower floor, or even just expand out like another room like this, it would take quite a bit of time with this regular stone pickaxe. And so one of the things that I do want to do in today's stream is uh, jumping back into the basic automation quest line, I would like to finally get a Tinker's Anvil. The Tinker's Anvil here is going to allow us to create more advanced Tinker's tools, including the Tinker's Hammer, which is basically a regular pickaxe, but it can mine in a three by three area, thus allowing us to clear nine blocks at a time. If we combine that with some redstone, and potentially a better base material than cobblestone, we could potentially create a very fast hammer that is able to clear out a rather large area very quickly. Before we get to that hammer though, what I do want to do is I do want to actually reset up this water wheel that we made at the end of the last stream. Over here, I've dug out what is probably going to be a temporary space for the water wheel. Again, once we get that hammer and once we can do some base reorganizing, we'll probably end up moving a lot of the stuff we put down today because um, I don't really want all of our immersive engineering stuff to be just like right here. But for the time being, if we quickly go ahead and grab a bit of cobblestone, what we should be able to do is we should be able to put down our kinetic dynamo, I think right about here. And again, we want this facing this way because the wheels go on the side with the black circle. You'll notice it's different on the other side. Uh, you can do that two ways. You can either put it down the right way the first time if you're facing the right direction. Um, alternatively, you can use the engineer's hammer to just rotate this. And I believe that is correct. It totally is. At which point we can do one, two, three. And I have set up this room in such a way that this should just work out of the gate. The plan here is to once again grab our water sigil. And once again, if we get a bit of uh, cobblestone here, uh, I want to put water up at the top. So what I've done here is uh, on the left-hand side, you'll notice there are two blocks of stone. That's to stop the water flowing back down this way. On the right-hand side, just as soon as I cool off here so we don't die, <laughs> on the right-hand side, we just have the one kind of line of cobblestone sticking out there. And that's going to allow the water to flow through this gap right here, down and around and under. And again, these little bits of stone here are also to stop the water flowing out at the corners. So without the water wheels here, if we go one, two, three source blocks, I think we should then be able to go one, two, three water wheels. And if things are working as intended, we end up with a fully functioning water wheel. Nice. So this is spinning, which is good. We've got those three water source blocks up above the wheel. Power should now be being generated by this kinetic dynamo. It does say zero FE in the top left there, but I think that might just be uh, either a bug or a visual glitch. The way that we can test that is if we head back through to the factory quest line, this next quest here is to make insulated LV wire coils. The quest wants us to make one insulated LV wire coil, one LV wire connector, and one LV wire relay. So the LV wire connector is fairly easy. It's four terracotta and three copper. Right now, in terms of clay, we actually only have six. And we might go on a bit of a tangent here, actually, because I do want to change our ore processing system just a little bit to allow us to get sand, because between streams, our system has been chugging along quite nicely. And what I did have to do when I came back onto the server today is I did have to add another tier five storage upgrade to this drawer because you'll notice we have over 16,000 redstone and coal. And so our redstone and coal was actually starting to back up in these drawers here and then eventually uh, back up on that chute over there. 
Um, but also we start to back up on glass as well. Over here, we've got 2,140 glass because we're turning all of our excess cobblestone that is generated from all of our ore processing into cobble, into gravel, into sand. And then all of that sand, which is down here, is being turned into glass. Now, the problem with that is that when it comes to making things like clay, currently our best way of making clay is via blood magic with the water sigil and sand. And currently we're turning all of our sand into glass. And so I think one of the things I would like to do here to try and rectify that situation is split the sand into two belts, one belt that goes straight to the glass and another belt that sends sand around into its own storage drawer. To do that, we can use the tunnel system that I showed, I think two streams ago now, if we make another mechanical belt. So we can take this, uh, we'll take more than one just in case, and then we should have some shaft lying around. We totally do. So basically, what I am thinking here is, much like I showed before, if you get two belts, and I guess actually we could probably do something like this and like this to save on shaft, and we put these tunnels, let's say here and here, this is where it gets a little dicey because we do need to be on top of this. But above here, you can see if we put on our goggles, we should be able to see the filter options for these tunnels. And we totally can. So right now it's set to when multiple outputs are available, split. So right now we have two options. We can either set this to split or we can set it to forced split. Because what we're going to do, of course, is we're going to take the uh, the sand from this belt and we're going to import it into the system. Ideally, we would get that sand kind of up and into this chest here. Although that's probably not strictly necessary. I think, if I'm not mistaken, we do still have one import cable left in the system. And so we can probably just grab another funnel, another chest and another import cable. So as per usual, if we just put a chest, let's say here, and then we put down our funnel right about there, now all the sand that is diverted should end up in this chest. And it totally does, nice. And at that point, of course, we can throw down another import cable. We'll put that, um, I think, probably right about here. And then we can just connect up this wire with one more network cable. And at that point, we should start importing sand into the system. Again, the option that we have back here between uh, split and force split is an interesting one because if you just set it to regular split, what will happen is because the sand making process, uh, sorry, because the glass making process is so slow, like because these items here fly upwards so very, very slowly, we'll get a lot more of the sand going through into the chest. Basically what happens is sand will come along and then it will try and split. So half of it will try and go to the first belt and half of it will try and go to the second belt. But if the first belt is full, all of the sand will go to the second belt. That's what happens if you set it to just regular split. If you set it to force split, one piece of sand will go on the first belt, then another piece of sand will go on the second belt, and then the, the third piece of sand will come along. And if the first belt is full, it will wait until it can get onto the first belt before it moves through. So if you set it to force split, that means we're gonna get an equal amount of sand and glass. But the problem there is that we then start to back up on sand because if there's nowhere for the sand to go, it will just start dropping down on this belt here and just start to clog up and cause lag in the world. So I think for now, leaving it on regular split is fine. That means that if it can, it will 50-50 it, but if it can't, all the excess sand will just go around into the system, which I think is ideal. Boom, that should now be set up and we should start to see that sand, there we go, get imported into the system. Nice. And so going forward, uh, we should start to see a lot more sand coming through. For now, though, we do have 55 sand and we do still have the water sigil here. I do want to do a quick check on my divination sigil. How much do we have in our system? We've got 2,500 LP. That should be fine. Uh, if we once again put in two sand and the water sigil here, we should start to slowly but surely generate clay. Uh, currently, this takes 350 LP per clay. So that is going to run through the, uh, the 2500 that we have fairly quickly. And so while we wait for this clay, I think it's probably not gonna be a terrible idea uh, for us to uh, once again, do some uh, dagger of sacrifice work over above the blood altar. Once we have that clay, we should be able to fairly easily uh, set up these uh, wire connectors. At that point, we should also complete the quest for the uh, water wheel. We might have to pick our water wheel up again, or maybe even just make um, another water wheel uh, in order to complete this quest. But once we do, one of the rewards that we get for completing that quest is a charging station. And that leads me nicely onto one of the other things that I think we should work on in today's stream, and that is getting a jetpack. Now, when I mentioned this to the, the Twitch chat, people were like, why do you need a jetpack when you're completely enclosed in 
a cave. And the idea behind the jetpack is less for the cave, although I think it is still useful for the cave. Uh, for example, over here, we can still use the jetpack to kind of fly up to that area without having to use ladders or elevators. But uh, my main goal for the jetpack, and I'm also not quite sure where in the world this guy came from, but my main plan for the jetpack is to allow us to more easily traverse the nether, specifically uh, when it comes to getting something like a blaze spawner. So if we can get the blaze spawner, we can get blaze powder, and we can start making eyes of ender, which are going to be useful for a whole array of crafts going forward. And I think once we have a jetpack, it's going to make getting that blaze spawner much, much easier, because instead of having to try and fight our way through a nether fortress, we can instead fly around, scout out a blaze spawner, fly over, pick it up, and then fly it back to the uh, to our cave here, making the acquisition of blaze powder much, much easier. Either way, before we get carried away with the jetpacks, we do have 64 clay here. Um, again, I'm not quite sure how these zombies are getting out. I may have made like a gap. Oh no, what I think has happened here is I think when I built this wall between streams, I uh, probably removed a torch or two, and actually what's probably more likely to have happened is at the end of the last stream, when I put down the water wheel like right here, we probably destroyed a good number of the torches that were on the ground, and so now if I press F7, yeah, this whole area is not well lit. I didn't notice that because we do have night vision thanks to our night vision trinket, uh, but real quick, let me just temporarily throw down a few torches here to stop even more mobs spawning uh, in the future. I think there's also probably a possibility that around here, yeah, there's even more space for mobs to spawn. Just to be safe, let's do something like that. Uh, but back over in our crafting terminal, we should be able to craft up some blocks of clay. We need four of those for the LV wire connectors, and then we need two more for the LV wire relay. So let's go ahead and make six clay blocks. We'll throw those, of course, into our nice, fast emerald furnace. Once we have those, I think we should basically be good to go on the, uh, the LV wire relay and the LV wire coil. So one is just two terracotta with two copper, and the other is four terracotta with three copper. And then the slightly harder bit is the insulated LV wire coil. This is made with four LV wire coils. These, fairly easy. I think we showed how to make copper wire previously. We use our engineer's wire cutters and our hammer. What we can do is grab some copper ingots, craft those down into copper plates using the hammer, and then craft those down into copper wire, at which point we should then be able to craft up some LV wire coil. Now, normally I would just use regular LV wire coil to transfer power. The trouble with using regular LV wire as opposed to using the insulated LV wire is that you actually take damage if you walk into the uninsulated cable. So uh, for those who don't know how this works, basically you can take your LV wire connector and place it on your power generating source, for example, uh, the kinetic dynamo, like so. And then if we were to get a device that actually requires power, we could then put another LV wire connector on that device. Let's imagine this block of cobblestone here required power. And then at that point, you can right click on one connector, right click on the other, and that will create a wire that transfers that power from the kinetic dynamo into that block. Again, though, the problem with this wire is that if you walk into it, you take damage. I think we would have to actually have it transfer power in order for us to take damage. But what you can do to mitigate that is you can invest in insulated cable. The trouble with that is that it requires industrial hemp fiber. Now, in the last stream, we did set up a grass platform, and I'm fairly certain that, yeah, we did get some industrial hemp seeds. How are we doing on bone meal? We have a fair bit of bone meal, albeit not a ton. If we're going to get this insulated LV wire, we need five tough fabric, which means that we need 40 industrial hemp fiber, which is quite a bit of hemp fiber. One of the other things I would like to do in today's stream is I would like to look at setting up our first garden cloche. If we can get the garden cloche up and running, we can automate the production of industrial hemp fiber, uh, which is not only useful for immersive engineering, but as we've seen previously, is also useful in the creation of string and therefore in the creation of infinite wool as well. For now though, let's quickly grab our hoe here and let's see if we can't get 40 industrial hemp seeds. I do think you get more than one per harvest. So if we do something like this, like this, and then we, uh, I guess we don't need to bone meal it because we can shift, right? Yeah, so I think it's probably well worth actually just throwing down a bunch of these and then shifting to get them much, much faster. Once they're fully grown, you just break the top. You don't have to break the bottom half. Like this, you get a bunch of industrial hemp fiber. We've already got 20, which is more than half of what we need in total. And then you can see that the top half then does regrow very quickly. And so actually getting the industrial hemp fiber here is really not too difficult whatsoever. Back over here, we can do something like this. I believe it was with sticks in the middle. 
it was. We need one, two, three, four, five of those, at which point we can then craft up our first set of insulated LV wire coil. That is that quest complete. And then the final quest here uh, that we've already completed, but that I will complete again, is for the water wheel. Uh, the reason I'm completing it again, as opposed to just taking down one of our initial water wheels, is that I think I might also set up a second water wheel, potentially uh, opposite wherever we end up putting the first water wheel. Boom, we have another water wheel and another quest complete. Nice. So let's go ahead and claim our thermoelectric generator, which can also be used, by the way, uh, to generate power. Uh, we'll get to that in the future. And also our charging station. So I've not used the charging station before, but I assume that it does allow us to charge things like the jetpack. Um, I'm also going to assume that it probably requires power be inputted from the back. So like we should before, we can put an LV wire connector on the back here. We can put one on the dynamo here. So again, normally, if you use LV wire coil, and I do want to show this uh, in action, we should take damage, I think. Oh, we don't take damage. I think it might be a con. Oh, no, we do take damage. It's just very low because it's a, a low voltage cable. That's fine. Um, but again, now that we have the upgraded variant, what we should be able to do is, again, throw down the connector and then this time connect it up with insulated cable. Boom and boom. And so now when we stand here, we actually don't take any damage. In here, this is now full. Uh, you'll see in the top left, it's got 32,000 uh, redstone flux. Uh, it does say KIF, uh, IF, RF, and FE are all interchangeable. So if you see the number IF, uh, it's the same as FE and the same as RF. They're all just different forms of energy, but they're all uh, convertible one-to-one. -one. You'll see here it says FE, then it says IF. They're the exact same thing. Uh, they're all just differently named versions of the same thing, if that makes sense. Uh, either way, real quick, we should be able to make at least a wood jetpack very easily. The wooden jetpack here is made with uh, four planks, two wood thrusters, one wood capacitor, and one leather strap. The uh, wood capacitor here is made with more wood and some wood energy cells. The wood thruster is made with even more wood, another wood energy cell, and some basic coils. The basic coils are made with iron and redstone. Uh, we do have quite a bit of iron and we've got a ton of redstone, so I will go ahead and make quite a few of these uh, because we are also going to need these, I believe, for the higher tiers of jetpack. And you do have to work from the bottom up. So in order to make uh, a tier two jetpack, like the iron jetpack here, uh, you do require first a tier one jetpack. And in order to make a tier one jetpack, like the stone jetpack, you have to first have a tier zero jetpack, like the wood jetpack. And uh, you'll see about halfway down the tooltip there, it says tier zero, and then tier one, tier two, uh, tier three, tier four, and then finally tier five with the emerald jetpack, the best one that you can get, but you do have to work through each tier in order to get up to that jetpack. Chat is telling me that I need 11 coils per jetpack. So I will quickly make uh, 22 coils here that maybe should get us at least a stone jetpack and then it looks like you also need five energy cells per jetpack as well so one two three four five one two thrusters and one capacitor and then the only thing we're missing is the leather strap at which point boom and boom we have a wooden jetpack nice so now we can throw that in over here by right clicking like so we see in the top left, the power is going down as it's being transferred into that jetpack. The wooden jetpack doesn't hold that much power. You'll see it only holds 20,000 FE. And so already it is fully charged, at which point we can place it onto our back. And on the left there, you'll see that we have 20,000 FE. We have our uh, throttle set to 100%. Uh, and then E, the E is the engine and H is hover. So right now the engine is turned off, which means it actually doesn't work. If we go to options, controls, and type in a uh, jetpack, and then click category, we should be able to see toggle engine is set to V by default and toggle hover mode is set to G. So does G work? It totally does. So if we press V, the engine turns on and now we can very slowly but surely fly around with our wooden jetpack. Nice. It's not the best jetpack in the world. And if we hover over it, I think it should tell us uh, how much power it uses. Yeah, it uses 32 FE per tick, which is quite a lot considering it only has 20,000. There are 20 ticks per second in Minecraft. And so uh, 32 FE per tick means about 640 uh, FE per second, which means um, if we were to use this like full throttle, if we were to just stand and fly like this, we would be able to fly for about 31 seconds before the jetpack ran out of charge, which is not particularly great. But that's why we have the higher tiers of jetpack. Uh, if we look at the next one here, this one does use more power, but it can hold five times as much power and it only uses twice as much. And it also has a bunch of other stats beneath it. Um, one of the most important ones for me at least is the hover speed. So if we look at this one, the hover speed is 0.14, which means if I do turn hover mode on, it's not really a hover mode. So if I let go, you still kind of fall pretty fast. 
With the higher tier jetpacks, for example, if you look at the Emerald jetpack, this one's perfect. It has a hover speed of zero, which means with the Emerald jetpack, if you turn hover mode on, you just stay perfectly still. Like you don't fall whatsoever. Whereas with the wooden jetpack, its hover mode is kind of terrible and you fall pretty quickly. There's also things like vertical and horizontal speed. Right now, the horizontal speed on the wooden jetpack is 0.06. Again, if we look at the most extreme example, the horizontal speed on the Emerald jetpack is 0.21, making it almost four times faster at moving forward horizontally, which makes a huge difference, especially when trying to traverse long distances, like we might end up doing in dimensions like the Nether, the End, or the Twilight Forest. And in fact, I think we probably should be able to make a fairly high tier jetpack here fairly easily. We do have 182 diamonds and 206 emeralds in our system. The only hard part about making the higher tier jetpacks is just the uh, tediousness of crafting them because they are basically the same recipe over and over again. Uh, for example, here we need two more stone thrusters, which means we need five stone energy cells. One, two, three, four, five. At that point, we can craft up two stone thrusters. One, and we're just missing a furnace for two, at which point we can then make the stone capacitor. And that should be everything, I think, for the stone jetpack. Nice. Again, this one is going to be slightly better than the last one. Again, with hover mode on, we fall a little bit slower. Still not particularly slow, but a little bit slower than before. We can then do the exact same thing with the iron tier here. Once you get up to tier two, we do have to start using advanced coils. These are, again, the exact same recipe, but instead of using iron, we use gold. And I think for the diamond jetpack, we upgrade even further, yeah, to elite coils, which again, the exact same thing, but with diamonds instead of gold. And then for the final tier, we need ultimate coils. Again, the exact same thing, but with emeralds instead of diamonds. So real quick here, chat, let's see just how far we can get with these, uh, these jetpack tiers, shall we? A good deal of crafting later boom we have an emerald jetpack which can hold 48 million fe or redstone flux or if it does use 880 fe per tick which is a lot it might not have been the most sensible idea to go right in for the highest tier jetpack especially given that at the moment i believe this water wheel produces about 100 fe per tick which is not a, a crazy large amount one thing we could do here is we could look at crafting uh, some kind of capacitor bank. Also, Twitch chat is uh, shouting at me to claim these rewards. I will do that uh, real quick here, although I don't necessarily think uh, we really need any of the stuff that we uh, that we just collected, but so uh, we can throw that back into the system. If we get a, a capacitor bank, we can use this, uh, and by capacitor bank, I mean these LV, MV, and HV capacitors. These essentially act as energy storage. So we could put down, for example, um, an LV capacitor, uh, maybe right about here, and then connect the water wheel to the capacitor and then the capacitor to the charger, thus allowing us to kind of store the excess power made by our water wheel, because right now it's generating power, but if the charging station is already full on power, then nothing actually happens. That's not a huge problem. Uh, this is slowly but surely gonna charge up. And in fact, right now we have nothing else to actually charge. So we can just leave our jetpack in there while we work on trying to get the Tinker's hammer over here. Also, another quick side tangent, down at the bottom, we do have uh, challenge quests, and I think each quest line uh, does have its own section of challenge quests, which are optional, but we could take a look at them. And I believe, in fact, the second one here, ore processing, is one we've actually already done. The challenge says make an automatic ore processing system with crushing, washing, and compacting nuggets into ingots and products sorted into correct chests slash drawers. Once you've automatic cobble gen, make it filter ores and send them directly to the ore processing system. We've done this. Ore processing is complete. We have a system that automatically crushes ores, washes ores, and then imports them into the correct chests or drawers, and, and also compacts nuggets into ingots. Either way, back up here, in order to make the Tinker's Anvil, 
we have to craft up one of these. So basically you can make it with almost any alloy in the game. Uh, the key being alloy because it means that you have to get a smelter before you can actually uh, produce the anvil. Uh, because again, you can't make alloys in that old melter. Between streams, I have gone ahead and melted down three blocks worth of molten brass. And so uh, real quick, if we just do something like this and pull that molten brass out into our seared casting basin, that's going to generate one block of brass. And then once we have three blocks of brass, um, it should be as simple as just crafting up the anvil. The only other things we need are a tinker station. And then I think we can use four seared brick as our blocks around that. And I'm fairly certain it's worth just replacing the um the tinker station that we already have because i'm fairly certain that the anvil can do everything that the tinker station can do and more so boom boom and then if we grab some seared stone boom and boom we get a tinker's anvil made with brass nice so in here we now have many more options on the left for the type of tool that we can make and again specifically the one that we're after is the sledgehammer this allows us to mine in um, a three by three area so to make it, we need a hammerhead, a tough handle, and then two large plates. So before we get to making this, because we are going to have to make uh, casts for these, and in fact, actually, uh, what we can do real quick is we can grab uh, some of our patterns and some of our cobblestone, and we can also come over here and do this and this. So we need a large plate, we need a hammerhead, and then we need a tough rod handle. The reason I made cobblestone versions of these is because we actually have to make casts of all of these if we're going to make these parts out of metals, right? So I think what I'm probably going to do is uh, grab some gold, if we have some. And actually, we're surprisingly low on gold. Uh, we do have nine ready to go here, which should be fine, because I think it's only one gold per cast. So if I put three gold in here, we should be able to make a cast for each of these. But I think we're going to try and use some better materials for the hammer than we currently have for our pickaxe. For example, I think it would not be a terrible idea to make our stone hammer head, and potentially the, uh, the stone large plates as well, out of cobalt. If we type hammer into JEI, we can see all of the different hammers that are available. And uh, for example, if we look at a stone hammer, it has a mining speed of 1.76 out of the gate and a durability of 416, whereas the cobalt variant has a mining speed of 4.30, so almost three times as fast out of the gate without adding any redstone to it to make it faster. And it also has a durability of 3,356, making it much, much more durable. And especially now that we have both our jetpack and easy access to the nether, I don't think getting cobalt is going to be that difficult for us going forward. Over here, we should just be able to do something like this to create each of the individual casts. Each of these do require quite a few resources. For example, the hammerhead here does require eight ingots worth of whatever we end up making it out of. Uh, the large plates require four, and then the tough handles uh, require three. So we are going to need a lot of resources to get this going. Thankfully, again, we do have uh, this jetpack here, which is currently at almost a million FE, which is fine. I'm going to turn it off. I'm also going to turn off hover mode. Actually, real quick, I will show you the hover mode working. Look at that. Perfect. <laughs> but uh, we'll turn it off because we do want to save the power. And you'll notice the power did start to go down very quickly there. Uh, we'll try and only use this kind of as and when it's needed. Also, real quick, before we head on through into the nether, let's just uh, repair our pre-existing pickaxe. And let's go see if we can't mine a fair bit of cobalt. At the moment, we've got two cobalt ore, which would uh, create four cobalt ingots in the smeltery. But uh, if we're going to create the head, we need at least eight. And uh, if we're going to use cobalt for the plates as well, we would need uh, even more. So back over at home here, we did run out of juice on our jetpack, so I have put that back in to charge. Um, we do now have 18 cobalt, and so that's more than enough for us to get our hammerhead going here. If we put four in, one, two, three, four, and then turn this on, that'll make the, the hammerhead when it's ready and i just spent a few minutes looking through uh, the different materials that we could use for our uh, tough handle and for our large plate so uh, in jei you can type in for example tough handle and then you can hover over these and hold shift to see the effect that they have on your tool much like we did with our pickaxe and when it comes to this hammer i was really looking for something with a high mining speed so for example here we've got this blood burn uh, material that has a mining speed modifier of 1x so this doesn't make the the hammer any faster or slower um, this one actually lowers the durability but increases the attack damage and attack speed so the blood burn tough handle is good for a sword for example but uh, for us the better options are things like rose gold which increases the mining speed by 1.25x so it multiplies the mining speed by 1.25x uh, electrum which multiplies it by 1.15x and then hepatizer which multiplies it by 1.2x so of those three 
the rose gold is the best in terms of mining speed. That's going to get us the fastest speed possible. However, rose gold does come with a drawback, and that's at the top there, the durability modifier is 0.6x. And again, if a number is below 1 in terms of the multiplier, it means it's going to lower the durability. So if we had um, a durability of 1,000 and we added the tough handle to it, it would take that durability down from 1,000 to 600. Whereas the hepatizin, for example, isn't quite as good in terms of mining speed. It's only 1.2x instead of 1.25x, but it does increase the durability by 1.1x while reducing the attack damage and uh, keeping the attack speed normal which I think is fine because we don't want to use our hammer for attack. We don't want to fight any mobs with our hammer. We want it to be as fast as possible and to have as much durability as possible. And so Hepatizen is an option. I did also bookmark Copper as well because Copper has the same mining speed as Hepatizen. It's not quite as good in terms of durability. It does lower the durability uh, by 0.85x as opposed to the Hepatizen, which increases the durability. But uh, Copper is much easier to get. Copper is just copper, we have it, right? Whereas Hepatizen is an alloy that's made in the smeltery using obsidian, cobalt, and copper. And that's not even the hardest bit because copper we have, cobalt we have, and obsidian we can get. The hard part is that to make Hepatizen, your smeltery has to be at 1,400 degrees Celsius. And to do that, you have to put blazing blood into your tank this guy right here, because lava, I believe, only gets up to 1,000. I don't think you can get up to 1,500 with the lava here. Yeah, it says temperature 1,000. And the blazing blood is made by putting blazes into the smeltery. So if we can get blazes into the smeltery, that will begin to damage the blazes and generate blazing blood. And so I would like to do that because I think it would be worth getting the uh, hepatizen tool, uh, tough handle. And the same is true for the large plates as well, by the way. Uh, the large plates here, I did the same thing looking through all the options. Electrum is pretty good. It has a mining speed of 9. Rose Gold is even better. It has a mining speed of 10. But uh, Rose Gold and Electrum both have very low durabilities. The Rose Gold here only has 175. Uh, the Electrum has 225. Whereas the hepatizen has 975 with a slightly lower mining speed of 8. However, we can offset that by adding in redstone as our modifier to increase the speed of the hammer overall. So we have made our cobalt hammerhead here, although the Twitch chat does make a good point in that if we do the same thing with the uh, hammerhead and we look at the different options, I, I think Hepatizen is just a strictly better cobalt. It has a mining speed of 8 as opposed to 7.5 and a durability of almost 1,000 versus the 800 on the cobalt head. Um, luckily, we can re-smelt this down if we want to to get the cobalt back. But uh, the real question now is can we, using our jetpack, which doesn't have a ton of charge in it. Can we go through to the nether, find a blaze spawner, pick that blaze spawner up using the carry on mod, which lets us shift right click like this, and then bring it back to the overworld? I think the answer to all of those questions is yes. Before we do, I, I think what I'm gonna do is I think I'm gonna make our smeltery bigger because I think what my plan here is, I'm gonna make the smeltery kind of as big as we can, which I think is an 11 by 11, but don't quote me on that, we'll find out in a second. Um, once it's nice and big, we can bring the blaze spawner back and basically put the blaze spawner inside of the smeltery, like just above the smeltery, block it all off, so that way the blazes will spawn, they'll land in the smeltery, they will get turned into blaze blood, and at that point we can then pull the blaze blood out and use it in the fuel tank here to allow us to make the hepatizer, which is then going to allow us to make, hopefully, a very fast and very powerful Tinker's Hammer. People are pointing out that as a reward for the Tinker's Anvil, for making this, we do get five silky cloth, and I believe if we put that silky cloth on our pickaxe like this, it does add silky, which I believe is basically silk touch. Mind blocks drop themselves instead of the usual items. So we can do this. We can add. We have one more um, modifier slot left on our pickaxe. And so we can use the silky cloth here to add silk touch to our pickaxe, which... Seems like it might be a bad idea just in general because we can use it later on for um, for other things that require it, but we can also use it here um, as well to actually pick up the blaze spawner. I think we will stick with the uh, the same plan over here of making the smeltery bigger and then putting the blazes in the smeltery to allow us to get the blaze blood. Eventually, we will move the spawner again, potentially with our silk touch or with the carry on mod uh, to another location. I do also want to move my zombie spawner um, as well fairly soon when we do a bit of a base redesign uh, because. We don't always want our blazers turning their, themselves into blaze blood. Eventually, we do want to actually farm the blazers for blaze rods and blaze powder as well. All right, so I've laid down a, a 9 by 9 seared brick base here. And I think, essentially, if we do the exact same thing that we did before, basically surround the edges here with more seared brick, creating an 11 by 11 kind of exterior. Uh, also, we are going to have to move 
this uh, market here. Thankfully, you can just uh, break this bit, and the uh, the villager will disappear to return later when he's uh, when he's requested. But uh, if we do something like this, and then we'll also, I guess, for now, move this as well. We have to find a new location for that. That's fine. We'll put this here. We'll put the controller back on the front like that. And if everything is correct, look at that. Boom. Okay, so this, it does start to fill up with all the, the trash that we don't want it to fill up with. Which is less than ideal. But we could take a lot of that stuff out. <laughs> and then hopefully uh, start to collect it in our uh, in our dank and whatnot. But this does work. This is now the correct size. And so hopefully, all we should have to do here now is grab our Emerald Jetpack. Which has hopefully got at least a little bit of, uh, of charge in it. Head on through into the nether and you'll see there's also a ton of slots in here now and we can also hold up to 648 ingots inside the smell tray not to mention the fact that of course if we wanted to uh, we could take some of the uh, the seared brick that we still have uh, and make this like even taller right now it's only one high uh, these right here are not currently doing anything whatsoever so we can in fact take these down here but uh, but yeah if we made this even taller we could get uh, even more capacity both in uh, the left hand slot here and also in the smeltery itself i'm fairly certain you do want to have um some form of liquid in the smeltery when you put the blazers in because if the blazers are just in and there's no like molten metal in the smeltery the blazers won't actually die so you do want to make sure there's a little bit of molten something in the smeltery for now i'm going to break that just so that we can spend a bit of time here digging out a slightly taller roof so again, not too long later, we now have a slightly taller room within which we should be able to put our blaze spawner. People have also told me you don't have to have any molten liquid in the smeltery to kill the blazes. Just having lava in the tank should be enough. So the question now is if we take our jetpack, which has just shy of 2 million FE in it. Also, by the way, by default, you can press a comma and period. If we go to options control and type in jetpack and click category, and you'll see that uh, increase throttle is set to period or full stop. And then uh, decrease throttle is set to comma. And if you press those buttons, you can decrease or increase the throttle on the left there. Doing that will change the speed at which you fly. So if you set it at 100 with this jetpack on, you fly like real fast in, in, in straight lines. Um, if you turn it down, you suddenly start to fly a little slower in straight lines which is definitely nice because it's maybe a bit fast out of the gate but uh, the question now chap is if we uh, quickly i guess take off our goggles here and maybe replace that with uh, the diamond helmet just to give us that extra level of uh, safety can we head on through to the nether and get a blaze spawner we are very close to another fortress and so i'm hopeful that we should be able to scout one out break it with our diamond pick and then head back before we uh, before we die that is the plan of course the trouble is uh, is not getting killed by blazers and or wither skeletons in the process here we go let's just quickly uh break that grab the spawner and then before you know it we're out of here jetpack on over a million fe still left to go right back to the portal let's not die to the fire that would be an incredibly embarrassing way to go And boom, quick little cool off in the pool. We do have this entity blaze spawner here. And so we should, in theory, just be able to place this down inside of this smeltery. Let's grab like a little bit of cobblestone maybe. Let's do something like, I'll put it one further up. I'll put it like here. And I think that should work. And much like our other spawner, I'm fairly certain that we should be able to use things like sugar uh, to increase the speed at which they spawn in. Now, this is not my long-term solution, by the way. Uh, I would like to make the smeltery taller, um, and I would also like to maybe get some dark glass if we have it. Yeah, we totally do. You can see through it, but it doesn't let light through. This is uh, pretty cheap, actually. Uh, it does require clear black glass, which we are going to have to dye some glass first to make that happen. But again, thankfully, we do have um, a fairly easy way of getting black dye. We can just uh, put coal through our crushing wheels, and then uh, we can get the dark glass very easily. And then we can use this uh, over here. And I, I think I'll put it like one back, so I'll put it like directly above the smeltery like that. I think it's going to look a bit better than having it where this cobblestone is, uh, but this allows us to see in, but doesn't let the light pass back out, although I don't really think the light level uh, matters for the blazes, but either way, aesthetically, I also think it looks quite nice. So now, 
Do we have a spare tank in the system? We totally do. We got one of these um, as a quest reward. So I think what we might be able to do here is if we get rid of this, if we put down the tank, I think we can set the blazing blood to the bottom, which you can do by clicking. So you click anything in here, it moves it to the bottom of the stack. And then from there, I'm hoping we can just, yeah, pull that out directly into the tank. These tanks do retain their contents when you break them. So we can pull all of that out. Once we've got a few buckets worth in there, two should be more than enough. We can then pick that tank up, replace the pre-existing tank, like so. And at that point, we should now be able to make hepatizen inside of this smelter. Uh, to do it, we just need obsidian, cobalt and copper again if we're gonna make a full hepatizen hammer that means that we need one hepatizen hammer head two hepatizen large plates and one oh sorry two hepatizen large rods no just the one rod okay that's fine so that is eight for the head uh, another eight for the two plates that's 16 and then one uh, and then three for the uh, the rods so we need 19 hepatizen if we're gonna make this work 19 hepatizen means that we'll go for 20 hepatizen. That means we need 10 obsidian, we need 10 cobalt, and we need 20 copper. 20 copper, we already have. 10 cobalt, we can get by putting five cobalt into the smeltery, that'll double to 10. And then the hardest part is 10 obsidian, which we can do, uh, and to do it, all we're gonna have to do is grab our water sigil, and then using our unlimited sauce over here, uh, we should be able to do something, uh, you know what, let's do something like this, let's do something like, this, this, and then like this. And then now we need to break 10 obsidian chat. So the Twitch chat is correctly pointing out that we can in fact make obsidian in the smeltery. And it's significantly faster than placing down lava and then trying to break that obsidian. So uh, over here, if we right click lava onto this tank, that lava actually goes into the smeltery. And then if we put water in as well, like so, that combines that lava and water into molten obsidian and you'll see that already that's starting to turn into molten hepatizen because we already have uh, the cobalt and the copper in there it's a bit of a mess in here now because some of the ores i mined whilst i was creating this area have melted into the smeltery as well but uh, essentially all we should have to do is come over grab some lava i did spend a bit of time just now getting more lp into our system so we've got eight thousand, which should be more than enough for the obsidian we're going to need and then we can just repeatedly do this and i don't think i can right click the sigil directly on there but I'm pretty sure I can do this, this, and this to get water in there. And so now we just need to do that over and over again until we have at least 19 hepatizen. So that is 18. One more bucket of lava should take us up to two blocks and two ingots. Yeah, which is 20 hepatizen. Nice. Okay, so now, chat, if we throw down our casting table, we can put down our hammerhead and hopefully pull out a hepatizen hammerhead. We could also melt down this cobalt hammer again, uh, hammerhead in the future again, but for now we'll just throw that uh, into one of these chests over here because it's not particularly useful to us at the moment. We can then take our plate cast and our tough cast. And once that's cooled, we can then pull out two large plates. And finally, the tough rod. And just as soon as that is done, we should have a full hepatizen Hammer. I wasn't planning on making it completely Hepatizen, but after looking through all of the stats, I think Hepatizen is probably the best balance, especially for the speed that we're after. So boom, boom, and boom. That gets us the Hepatizen Sledgehammer. Durability of 4,288 with a mining speed of 3.84. So we'll take this, and immediately we do have 20,000 redstone, so we can take a good amount of that, put this back in, and we can use one of our modifiers here to enable haste, like so. That's going to take the mining speed up to 5.84. And so now, going forward, we should be able to use this to hopefully clear out large areas a good deal faster than we did previously. And to be honest, if we wanted to, we could even go one step further and use our final modifier here for even more redstone, which I think is probably well worth it because redstone is... Because speed is really all that we're after with this hammer. That takes our mining speed up to 7.84. And so now going forward, I can use this to uh, clear out larger areas of space, hopefully allow me to create more rooms and more space for us to build more stuff. Uh, between streams, like I said, I think I'll try and do some work on making this look a little bit nicer. Uh, you can use this seared brick here as a decorative block, and I do quite like the way this looks. I might end up using some of that um, around the base going forward. Real quick, let me make sure I put my jetpack on charge. Hopefully we'll come back next time to that being fully charged, which would be fantastic. People have also mentioned that we do have momentum speed on here. So the more we use this, the faster it gets. I think it's the more we use it like consecutively, right? So as we start mining, like I think it gets faster and faster as we go. 
Yeah, it's definitely getting quicker. And you'll see the durability is barely even going down because it has just so much durability. Which is very nice indeed. So now that that hammer is done, we can go ahead and unbookmark all the stuff on the left here. The final thing that I want to work on in today's stream is getting a garden cloche up and running so that going forward, we can automate the growing of things like our industrial hemp, but not only our industrial hemp, we can also automate uh, the growing of most other crops uh, in the game. So to make a garden cloche, we need a couple of things. We need four glass, two treated wooden planks, one iron mechanical component. This is fairly easy to make. It's four iron and one copper ingot, and the iron there being in plate form. We do have five iron sheets ready to go, and so we should just be able to shift-click that in. Good stuff. We then also need a vacuum tube. The vacuum tube here is a little tricky in that it requires the engineer's work table. So to make this, we need an engineer's crafting table, a treated wooden fence, two treated wooden slabs, and an iron ingot. The crafting table, more slabs, and more sticks with a crafting table in the middle there. None of that seems too difficult. It is going to be a fair bit of treated wood, and we did use most of our treated wood earlier today on making um, another water wheel to complete the quest. So I think we might want to go and quickly top up on buckets of creosote oil. Thankfully, this has still been running. We do have 12 buckets of creosote ready to go, which in turn is going to get us 32 treated planks, which I think should be more than enough for what we're trying to do here. So if we just do wood and creosote bucket, we get one, two, three, and four lots of treated wood. We can then make a fair few treated planks as well as a fair few treated sticks. And then from there, hopefully we have basically everything that we need in order to make the engineer's crafting table. We do some treated wooden fence, the engineer's workbench itself. And then for now, we'll put this down, let's say maybe here. We can always move it in the future if we need to. And then now, in order to actually make that vacuum tube, we also need to get an engineer's blueprint. There are quite a few blueprints added by immersive engineering. So we want to make sure we get the right one. The right one here is the crafting components blueprint. You'll see that some are banner patterns, common projectiles, crafting components, arc furnace electrodes. We're after the crafting components projectile. Uh, also, I would very much so like it if you did not hit me, my friend, whilst I am busy. To make this, we need three paper, three blue dye, and then one iron, aluminum, and copper ingot. We do not have most of that. However, we do have the sugar cane required to make three paper, and we do also have the lampers required to make three blue dye. And so from there, we should be able to craft up the crafting components blueprint. And at that point, now in here, we should be able to make the vacuum tube required for the garden cloche. All we need is one glass, one nickel plate, one copper wire, and one redstone. So we do have a copper wire remaining from earlier, which is good. We've got a ton of glass, thanks to our glass smelting system. Uh, nickel, we do have. We don't have it in plate form. However, uh, as per usual, we can take our engineer's hammer and just craft up a plate like so. And then the final item there was just a single piece of redstone, of which we have almost 20,000. So one, two, three, four gets us three vacuum tubes. And then from there, chat, that should be everything to make the garden cloche. Nice. So let's go ahead and drop that down. Again, maybe like here for now, although again, most of these things will be moved uh, fairly shortly. Now, this is where we actually need to use the wire relays because you can only have one LV wire connected to an LV wire connector at any given time. So the way that you connect to multiple things, like for example, if I try and right click here, it will not work because it says you cannot attach wire here. So what we need to do is we need to disconnect the old wire, put down an LV connector here, as well as an LV connector here, the cloche receives power from the top, and then we can use this LV wire relay as a buffer between the two. So the relay cannot transfer power, so you couldn't, for example, put the relay directly onto the, um, the charger here or directly onto the cloche, but what you can do is go from the power source to the relay, and then from the relay to all of your machines that need power, like that. And so now you'll see that much like the charger before it, in the top left, the cloche there is going up in terms of power. And so now we can begin to look at actually using this. On the left here, this tank requires water. In the middle, 
what we should be able to do is we should be able to throw down a block of dirt as well as one hemp seed. And as soon as this is provided with water for that left slot, it should begin growing this industrial hemp. So if it has power and water, it should be good to go. Now, in terms of providing it with water, we do have this mod installed right here, Cooking for Blockheads, which provides this sink, which acts as an unlimited water source in and of itself. And it's really not too difficult to make. It's three iron ingots, one bucket of water, and five terracotta. Again, the terracotta could be a bit of a pain, depending on how much clay we have and how much clay we can make. Although, never mind, we've got 186 clay ready to go. The reason, by the way, that we have so much clay right now is that there is currently a problem with our system, as per usual. You'll see here that we're actually clogging up on uh, nuggets. That's because there's flint blocking the system here. The flint can't go in because the flint's not a nugget, and that's stopping all the other nuggets from making their way into the system. Uh, the reason that there's flint here is the same reason we have a lot of clay in the system, and that's that this filter right here is set to is washable or can be washed. And that means that uh, because sand and gravel can be washed, those are coming down as well, when really sand and gravel should be going to the left to be either turned into sand or, in the case of sand, turned into glass. So we are going to have to change that filter at some point in the near future in order to stop the, the gravel and the sand clogging up this system. But for the time being, the good news is that that does mean we have uh, enough clay here to smelt down into five terracotta. We'll look to fix that problem in the future. For now, we have a sink which we can go ahead and put down, uh, let's say, right about here. And uh, if we take a bucket, you'll see if we uh, shift, actually, in the top left there, uh, that there are like 200 and, uh, like 2 million buckets uh, worth of water in this. Essentially, it's unlimited water. Even if you take a bucket out, it stays at that full amount. So uh, we can get infinite water from this. Even better, if we can get a fluid pipe, and this is where the pipes mod comes into play, uh, we have fluid pipes here, which are fairly easy for us to make. Good stuff. From there, what we should be able to do is put down a fluid pipe like this, and I think we have to connect to the front here. Although maybe we have to connect to the back. No, it is to the front. There it is. So the water goes in this front slot, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think the pipes mod adds its own wrench. It does, the pipe wrench, which thankfully also fairly easy to make. And then from there, all we have to do is shift right click on the extraction point and you'll see it changes the end there. And now in the top left, it says transferring 50 millibuckets every tick. And if you were, were keen eyed there, you'll notice this actually did start growing. So in here, it has water, it has power. And so now it is automatically growing this industrial hemp fiber. So this process is gonna produce industrial hemp fiber and industrial hemp seeds. And so if we get a one by two draw, that being a storage drawer that can hold two items, unlike these ones that can hold four, what we can do is we can place that right on the front, like so, and then this will automatically output the things that it creates. So this will automatically grow the hemp seed, and then using the water and the power, will harvest the industrial hemp fiber and the industrial hemp seed, and then push those out into the straw up front. And as you can see, if I don't pick it up, if we hold shift in the top left there, we already have one industrial hemp fiber and two industrial hemp seeds. It's not insanely fast. It's not like incredibly quick. You'll see that this one's about to get harvested any second now, but it is automated and it will last forever. It'll just keep going over and over and over again. Uh, you don't have to get new seeds. You don't have to pipe the seeds back in. These seeds that we have here are free and unlimited. And this one will just keep reusing the same seed over and over and over again to produce an unlimited amount of hemp fiber. And so going forward, we can just come over here when we need string, grab some hemp fiber and craft it into string. And then if we needed to craft that string into wool as well. So this is all good. Between streams, I will spend some time setting up a new room, at least one new room, maybe multiple new rooms, depending on how things go, um, for this stuff. Like, again, I don't really want any of this stuff to remain here. It's kind of jankily placed down at the moment. I'll also look into uh, redecorating a little bit, trying to make this place look a little bit nicer, especially now we have this uh, new hammer. We can mine out large areas very quickly, and uh, going forward, it should be a lot easier for us to automate farming. Again, we can make more garden cloches to automate the growth of things like the sweet berries that we're using to make our fruit salads and, and really any other uh, crop that we want to grow going forward. For now, though, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today's stream there.